Deputy Daly. Yeah, no, I, I do value these amendments seriously and, and I think in, in some ways they may be deemed to be a little bit technical and heavy going but I do think they're important and they touch on a, a number of boxes and they're dealing with the whole monitoring of the issue of uh, electronic monitoring which has been put forward as an alternative to somebody being car incarcerated so obviously we welcome that but it's very uh, important that there are guidelines around the use of electronic monitoring that's not with my words only, uh, European courts and data protection issues would require us to actually do that. Now, electronic uh, monitoring, I accept, is a useful tool in the criminal justice system. In Denmark, for example, 60% of all custodial sentences under six months are converted to electronic uh, monitoring and intense supervision. In Belgium, any prison sentence of less than three years is automatically commuted to electronic uh, tagging. Uh, so I do see a role for it. I'm not saying it shouldn't be used but it needs to be controlled carefully and what my amendments are trying to do here is really beef up the safeguards. Now the wording of paragraph A of the amendment is largely taken from the Council of Europe's 2014 recommendations on electronic monitoring. The Council of Europe advises that it's necessary that the decision to electronically tag somebody on bail takes into account the offence that's alleged the person has committed. While I've no doubt that judges would use their discretion and would apply sanctions fairly. At the same time, I think we have to tighten up provisions around duration because if we don't, then delays could mean somebody being tagged for a very long period of time that would be disproportionate to the crime. And let's face it, the people who are being tagged here are people who have not actually been convicted of any uh, crime either. I think very important are the points being made in relation to data protection. And what the insertion we're proposing to do is, is to cover a couple of things. First, we want to ensure that all of the data gathered as part of electronic monitoring is stored and processed in accordance with data protection acts and secondly that the data is only used for specific purposes namely monitoring the compliance of the conditions imposed as part of the electronic uh, monitoring and amendment 4 provides that the monitoring of people wearing tags will henceforth be done on a non-commercial not-for-profit basis and that's to prevent sort of private security firms getting in on the gig to try and, and make a killing out of this. Now, I have to say I was a bit surprised that there were no specific explicit safeguards either in this bill or in the 1997 Bail Act around data protection, particularly in uh, this day and age and particularly around the issues of the uses to which data uh, gathered can be, can be put to in cases where tags are attached. I think it's particularly surprising that we haven't explicitly say, stated this. Um, when the Council of Europe recommendation on the implementation of electronic monitoring actually explicitly states that the use of data collected through electronic monitoring should be regulated by law. And that's what I, I'm, I'm seeking to do here. We live in a world where data is big business and people pay big money for it. So therefore, the person's data, particularly in these uh, private matter should only be used for the purposes for which it is being gathered. And I think if we don't do this and put in these provisions, we're actually quite likely to run into problems with Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which gives strong protections to the fundamental right to privacy. Uh, they say, you know, it's, it's, we need a sound um, framework of specific principles and standards protecting the rights of individuals. Uh, so therefore, I, I would have hoped now, to be honest, that this amendment would be accepted. I don't actually see it as being particularly controversial at all, uh, unless we're trying to leave the door open to, to private commercial operators to make big bucks from the... Um, data being collected, I, I, I don't really get it like now. I know and remember that at committee stage, uh, deputies from Fine Gael said that my attempt to put electronic monitoring on a, on a not-for-profit basis was ideological. Funny, because that's exactly what the Council of Europe state the issue is. They say uh, uh, that the, the, under their standards and ethics in electronic monitoring handbook, government decisions to use commercial organisations to deliver electronic mo monitoring are as likely to be taken on ideological grounds as on practical uh, grounds. And there have been some problems in other states where public service providers um, 
the, the service was being provided privately, where they've subsequently had to try and bring that in under the public domain. And what I'm trying to do is put it up front at the start uh, that there wouldn't be anybody profiting from this type of uh, procedure. And I know I did speak at committee stage about the German model, which is based on de escalation and, so far as possible, helping offenders not to breach bail conditions. That should be the direction that we're in. And uh, in that sense, I think the monitoring of tagging should be done by professional people, social workers, people who can go in and intervene to de-escalate, not you know, sort of catch people out and have them whipped off uh, into prison because we're trying to get a position where that, that wouldn't happen. And I think there's a greater danger of that happening if it was uh, a private for-profit operator. So I, I, I see these actually as quite important and, uh, sure and the, the debate the around these two amendments will be actually hugely long. But in any case, it is about decisions decisions around bail being set out in writing. And this is a matter which we discussed in committee, and I think there are a number of very important reasons why that will be done. I think, firstly, there's the whole issue of transparency, promoting uh, public confidence in the system. At present, it's sometimes difficult for both the public and certainly even uh, and victims in many instances to understand why bail decisions are being taken. Therefore, I think having those decisions available in writing Motion, she, amendment she's on, please. Six. Six, thank Six you. Six is my, it's been grouped with Deputy O'Brien's. Yeah, yeah. So I think having the decisions available in writing would actually help the public to understand, as well as making the courts less op opaque. And I think, you know, obliging judges, if requested to give their reasons in writing, will also help, we would hope, to promote consistency in decisions around the granting or refusal of bail, or indeed the imposition of various um, conditions in that regard. Because I think if we want to understand the current use of bail and to begin research compliance uh, with conditions, likelihood of breaches and so on, then having the information provided in writing by the court is actually really important. And I think similarly, if we want to in, uh, encourage a more select use of, of remand in place uh, of bail, then it's essential that information on the reasons for bail decisions should be publicly available. Now, my preference was, as is indicated in uh, Deputy O'Brien's um, amendment, to require and oblige judges to give their reasons in writings in all instances, but I was conscious of the points made by the Minister and I think Deputy O'Callaghan at committee stage that given the number of bail applications, if we were to do that, that the judge that the judge wouldn't be able to do anything else other than write out the reports around, uh, around these decisions which could use to uh, delay the system. So therefore, I suppose as a compromise, I put forward this uh, amendment now where a judge, if asked, must give the reasons in writing and I think it would help improve the system. Obviously, if we're not requiring them to do it in all instances, we're losing maybe a potential nugget in terms of information that we would get if we had them in all cases, but I, I accept at the moment it's probably not practical to have it in all instances. My own preference would have been that in all cases uh, the decision would be put into writing, but I do recognise that there is quite a number of bail applications every day and to have it in every single case. Uh, what I do think it would be valuable in terms of the information and the data which could be collated, I do recognise that it may be um, too much in terms of uh, the expectations on a judge to do it in every case. But I do think the, uh, Deputy Daly's uh, amendment uh, captures it and she says where it, it, it has been requested. And, uh, we would certainly be supporting that and in light of that I am willing to withdraw my own motion, um, but I would uh, urge the government to consider Deputy Daly's amendment. Uh, I think it is important that uh, where a request has been made uh, for it to be put in writing, then that should be uh, facilitated. Okay, thank you, Deputy. So I confirm that uh, uh, amendment number seven is withdrawn. Uh, and back to amendment six, Deputy O'Callaghan. Deputy is correct in stating that the process should be transparent. I think it is transparent, however. When somebody makes an application for bail, it's done in an open court. Uh, the public can hear it. The judge makes a decision at the end of it, and that decision is generally given on an extemporary basis. He or she reads out or just speaks out the judgment. 
Um, there is a digital audio recording in every court, so it's possible to get a record of what was said by a judge at the time. My only concern about this uh, amendment is that it will mean that if I'm applying for bail on behalf of someone, I make the application to the judge, the guards either oppose it, presumably they oppose it, and then I have to say to the judge, by the way, before you make a decision, I want you to know that that decision has to be in writing. If that's going to happen, it's going to, the application has to be adjourned. The uh, applicant is going to be, continue to be remanded in custody until such time as there is a decision, and it's going to take time for that decision to be put down in writing. I know the objective of both uh, Deputies O'Brien and Deputies Daly is to ensure that you can build up a body of case law so people will look to see whether are the judges consistent in how they apply this. I think that's something that can be achieved by maybe the Department of Justice working upon having automatic uh, transcription of the digital audio recording so that decisions can be provided. But I just think the process here that where an applicant applies for it to be in writing, the applicant is going to suffer. They're going to have to wait for another two weeks for the judge to come up with a written decision. Okay, thank you, Deputy Minister. As the deputies have outlined uh, the purpose of Amendment uh, 6 and 7, 7 is now withdrawn, is to require that the reasons given by court for the granting or refusing bail and for imposing any bail condition uh, under Section 6 are in writing. Um, I can understand the deputy's reasons for wanting to include such a requirement. However, um, the purpose of Section 6 of this bill is to improve the information uh, provided by the court in bail hearings. Um, the effect of 7 would have been to require a written decision be given in respect of all bail hearings, and I heard what Deputy uh, O'Brien had to say about that. Um, Amendment 6 is more limited in scope, as it would only require the decision to be given in writing on request. However, I would say that even with the more limited amendment, you can hear the practical implications that Deputy O'Callaghan has, has spelt out there. And the fact remains that uh, written decisions are not the norm in the district court, uh, and the volume of work uh, that would be involved in implementing the deputy's proposals could be very considerable. And I, I think that you know, it, it would have uh, cost implications, and I think inevitably, again as has been said, I think it would entail delays in the processing uh, of cases before the courts. And that, you know, that's an issue at present. I think this would you know, even uh, make that more likely. Uh, and the other point that's already been made is that all of the, re, uh, uh, all of the district uh, court proceedings are already recorded on the uh, digital audio recording system. So in circumstances where clarification is needed, um, uh, or, uh, say clarification of the reasons given is required, or just say that they were in dispute, then the record of proceedings will be there. So um, for these reasons, I won't be accepting the amendment. Okay, thank you, Minister Deputy Daly. I, I, I think there is uh, contradictions in, in what both the Tonishta and Deputy O'Callaghan have said, because on, on the one hand, they're uh, making the argument that this is going to be an enormous burden of work for our hard-pressed district court judges who are flat out already, and I, I accept that they are, yeah. have felt, but then on the other hand, you say, should the information is there anyway, people can get it, so if it's there anyway... Uh, what's the problem? And I think that uh, Deputy O'Callaghan's point about a judge in making his or her decision is likely to have expressed those reasons verbally in court. Well, then the evidence, if the court is on a digital recording system, all the judge has to do, if the person requests it in writing, is to go and get an extract of that, print it out and make sure they have it. And the reason for that is that, and in my absolute, genuine personal experience, on behalf of citizens and citizens themselves, to get your hands on a DAR record from our courts is nigh on impossible in many instances for citizens to access that. So I think people won't get the information in that circumstance. And if it's there, as the deputies say it is, well then, what's the problem? Let the judge access it, because God knows every time I've tried to get it for people, I haven't been able to, to do it, and I know many people uh, haven't either. The other point is there's nothing in this amendment which says that the decision is delayed by the request in writing. The, the judge has been required to explain their reasons in writing, their decision in writing, which implicitly means the decision has been made and will be implemented. It doesn't alter the decision being implemented, so the bail applicant isn't being held in limbo with nowhere to go. After the decision is made, they have access to it in writing. If they want to challenge or their legal people do, or to transport. So those issues don't apply either. So I don't accept the reservations by the deputies, and I will be uh, pressing it. Okay, thank you, Deputy. Deputy O'Brien. 
make just there in, in conclusion, and that is that uh, this wouldn't delay um, decisions being made because a decision would have to be made before somebody could request the outcome of that decision, so I don't agree with Deputy O'Callaghan. I also don't agree, Minister, that this would be an enormous cost, because if it was an enormous cost in the Exchequer, believe me, this, mo this amendment would have been ruled out of order, like many other amendments, um, if there is a cost in the Exchequer. So I certainly don't accept that. Look, I, I, I think it's a very reasonable request. I mean, as I said, I would have been in favour of, uh, in, o in all cases, but uh, Deputy Daly has limited it to where somebody has made a request. And, I mean, if this place has taught us anything, then the blacks are up online the following day. It can be very easily, you know, a case of somebody just going to the transcript, copy and pasting what was said, and then giving it to the individual. I don't think it's an enormous uh, ask. Uh, I do think that it is uh, a very reasonable amendment, and uh, I do think that you should accept it. Thank you, Deputy. Deputy Wallace. Say that uh, on Jim's point about the DAR and the digital audio recording, uh, I had two uh, particular experiences with it uh, myself. One of them I just couldn't get it, and the other one they made it so it was so expensive that it uh, was too costly. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Deputy um, Minister. Don't have much more to say, really. I mean, the, the key point here is the, is the delay which would result from issuing decisions in writing, where that's not the norm in the district court. Um, everybody knows that the volume of bail cases before the courts is, is very substantial. Uh, and to divert resources to provide a written decision uh, in every case would uh, create further delays in the process. Now, even a, a written decision provided only on request has the potential to create delays, uh, and it's impossible to gauge the level of uh, requests there would be. So I think it's a very, it's a very practical you know, response to it. I think there are uh, fairly large resource and delay issues in, involved in this. I mean, I can see what people are saying, but I think the reality of the number of cases before the courts and trying to do this, it really is going to divert resources and delay decisions. Okay, yeah, there is uh, one point that strikes me in this as well, and it does not say, you know, if, if the um, person who is uh, applying for bail or whatever, if they come back within a week, within a month, within six months, within a year, within two years, it doesn't actually say whether there's any restriction on a person looking for that information. So if somebody three years later decided, well, I'd like to know why the judge didn't give me bail, and I, I go and ask, this would mean, this would mean they, should, they should get it, which would be totally impractical. So there's, a, there's an inbuilt technical flaw in these two, um, two amendments, in my view, as well. Okay, Deputy, Deputy O'Brien, and then I come to Deputy Daly to conclude. Deputy O'Brien. I think we're grasping at straws now to suggest that somebody might come yeah, back three years months later months looking months for reasons. Months. Look, it is a possibility, but let's, but let's face it, it is a very remote possibility. And I, and I also think that the Minister is either not reading the amendment correctly or just, again, grasping at straws. I mean, it's not going to delay the decisions, Minister. A decision has to be made before a request can be uh, submitted for the outcome of that decision. So it's not going to delay uh, any decisions being made. I mean, it's quite clear that uh, you can only make a request upon a decision having been made. So I don't accept your point. Conclude. Very adequately detailed, but there's no delay involved whatsoever. That point is absolutely black and white. And uh, again, in terms of the minister's point about, oh, sure, look at this could be coming years afterwards, you'd never get the information. Well, I mean, that information is supposed to be kept. So there shouldn't be any difficulty in accessing it, particularly if it's digitally recorded, the access is there, and if uh, the deputies are saying that it is, well then it shouldn't be. It's not just the applicant. In some instances, people have really struggled to find out why decisions were made. Uh, it can also be the victim who might want to know, who to understand why that was made and to help that process. And I think that's entirely appropriate. We've seen decisions. and. Very horrific cases, actually, in some instances where people were granted bail and actually went on to uh, commit a crime afterwards, a crime that has stayed with people, family members, for 
the rest of their lives grappling with this. And that person might like to look at how in God's name or what were the reasons for that judge making that decision to let that person out when they subsequently went on. And I think those should be available in writing. And I think it's a safeguard. There's no basis to say this is cumbersome. The decision is, if the request comes after the decision, nobody's rights are impaired in that. If the information is there, it should be the switch of a button for them to write down the report. It doesn't involve a huge amount of work, I thought, as Deputy O'Brien very uh, admirably put it. If it was a cost to the Exchequer, we would have heard about it before now. You know. Okay. Thank you, Deputy. So, are you moving the amendment? How stands it now, Deputy? Are you moving the amendment? Okay. The question is that the amendment be made, and I'm talking about amendment number six. Na taqti ta vavar abradish ta. Na taqti ta in chuna abradish nil. Shilam gwilan kesht kate. Vote on.